you. Good afternoon. Good to see you back at the little lunch lecture today. Um, it's I don't even know what day it is. I'm not even going to try. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's January 29th, right? <laughs> yeah. Yay. Uh, I'm Stephanie Moret. I'm the director of donor relations at the Coastal Land Trust. And once again, we are glad you joined us today. Um, we're recording the lecture and it's on Facebook Live, just an FYI. Um, Van's going to stick some links in the chat as usual. If you guys have not yet signed up for our e news, please do that. Um, and if you just love the little and want to toss a little donation our way, we would uh, appreciate that too. Um, as always, we'll keep everybody on mute during the talk, but there will be time for Q&A at the end. And so um, you can unmute at that time and ask a question, or you could type it in the chat and we'll have, uh, we'll have conversation that way. So um, our speaker today is Lauren Colodi, the Deputy Director of the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Lauren heads up the Coastal Fed's goal for clean coastal water, including outreach and implementation of the newly developed nature-based stormwater strategy action plan. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Conservation from NC State and has worked for the Federation since 1992. Um, even though that project sounds really great um, that Lauren works on with the Coastal Fed, she's here today to talk about the partnership efforts to conserve Bird Island. Um, so Lauren, we are very much looking forward to hearing that story and um, it's, it's all you, take it away. Okay, thanks and um, hello everybody. I recognize uh, several of the names and some of the faces. Some people don't have their cameras on, which I understand. <laughs> I mean, I, we're all getting used to these Zooms, aren't we? It's kind of the way, the way it is uh, now. But anyway, great to see everyone and thanks for joining in today. Um, I am Lauren Clody, Deputy Director, as mentioned with the Coastal Federation, and I'm gonna to talk today about um, kind of a collaborative effort that I was really um, lucky to be a part of when I first started at the Coastal Federation back in 1992. Yes, almost 30 years ago, I was fresh out of um, college and um, had learned about you know, policy and how things are supposed to work, but this was something that uh, was just a true blessing that this actual project was one of the first things I got to, to work on because it really showed the impact that people can have and that people do have in guiding and steering kind of coastal policy and what passion can do. So I'm going to tell you about that today. One thing about this though, I will tell you, I'm talking about saving Bird Island in the early years. There have been some recent efforts, uh, most recently in 2020 with some additional acreage that's been um, been protected and but I'm really going to focus kind of on the early years and the work that I did at the Coastal Federation in partnership with the Coastal Land Trust. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, the Coastal Federation is a nonprofit 501c3 membership supported organization and we were founded in 1982 by Todd Miller, our executive director. Uh, we're like the Coastal Land Trust, which is also nonprofit, but where Coastal Land Trust focuses on land acquisition and protection, we do all kinds of uh, different elements, including uh, advocacy around five key goals. Um, we work on living shorelines, which are alternatives to bulkheads. Um, we focus on thriving oysters. We do oyster restoration and protection through the North Carolina Oyster Blueprint, and we partner on the newly created um, Oyster Trail. You guys may have heard of that recently, and if you haven't, hopefully you will. We work on clean water. That's the goal that I lead up. Um, we've done a lot of uh, efforts recently to reduce marine debris. Uh, we've, we've noticed, especially after Hurricane Florence, the massive amounts of debris that are in our coastal marshes, especially, you know, uh, abandoned vessels. And then from that hurricane, really a lot of dock and pier debris, just big chunks of docks and piers. And just even like kind of as a statistic, um, between July and January, J July of last year and January, we've removed um, over 250 tons of debris from our marshes in the central and southeast coast. And we're getting ready to, to remove a lot of abandoned vessels. Um, we also work for effective coastal management. I see that Carrie's on today and Carrie works closely on that goal as our coastal advocate in the southeast region. We work on things, uh, we'll be doing a forum on microplastics coming up, which is a huge issue. One of those that you can't see 
or smell or taste, but uh, you know, it's probably, I hate to say in all of us right now, it's in the water and, and you know, food that we're eating. It's a huge issue. So we work on all kinds of different things um, and projects. Um, one though I'm focusing on today is Bird Island and Bird Island, um, I don't know if you wanna put it in the chat or I hope many of you have been to Bird Island, which is in Brunswick County, adjacent to Sunset Beach. Um, it's one of the last remaining undeveloped islands, um, one of three in North Carolina and, and um, just one of the few remaining in the mid-Atlantic coastal region. I'm gonna, this is a, an old photograph uh, that was taken by Conrad Lohman and this was before we had drones. So this was an aerial from an airplane, but what I wanna point out right here is this is Mad Inlet. Okay, so it's a small inlet and uh, back in 1998, this inlet actually closed. So this is Bird Island. Uh, this is the South Carolina line. So part of it is approximately here anyway, part of the island is in South Carolina, but Sunset Beach is up in this direction. And I'm just gonna point this out, but the, the they were going to put actually a bridge from Sunset Beach, which would be up here over to the island, like a series of bridges and causeways to go this way. So I just wanna utilize that picture to kind of show you that background. Um, around 1992, the owner of Bird Island, which is here, was actually proposing to build a mile long system of bridges and causeways across the inlet, which here now the inlet has closed in this picture, it would have gone right here. Um, but it was gonna support like a 15 lot subdivision to the island. And um, this is, um, this area was an, is an inlet hazard area. And then Bird Island is also part of the Coastal Barrier Resource Act, which prevents federal expenditure of, of services like electricity and, and roads to go in these, in these uh, designated areas. Um, and soon after the proposal, right when I had really just started at the Coastal Federation, we received a call from a gentleman named Bill Ducker. And he was concerned about this development proposal that he had heard. Let me, let me flip back. Bill Ducker lives right here. So he learned about it. I don't know if he learned about it as an adjacent property owner, if it was in the newspaper, but he contacted us know, asking for help, like what could be done. And so the Coastal Federation went down and met with lots of local residents to kind of discuss some options for stopping the development because it was just so incompatible with, with that area, especially with the designations of a Cobra zone and being in an inlet hazard area. Well, we also met with Camilla Hurlovic and Camilla, who the now retired director of the Coastal Land Trust, had just started the Coastal Land Trust. It was a brand new organization. She had a tiny office downtown. Her hair was black and down to her waist. And that's when I met Camilla. And we've had um, the privilege to work to, with her kind of over the past you know, couple of decades. So I'm glad that she's gotten to retire. And I'm kind of, I'm up at almost at the top of the roller coaster getting ready to look down um, one day soon, but we worked with Camilla and also met with um, Audubon, North Carolina to discuss strategies for, you know, not only stopping the, the development, but to ultimately to, to acquire the land. And with uh, the local residents that were extremely passionate about this, we actually formed what's called the Bird Island Preservation Society. And um, the Coastal Federation actually served as physical agent for the society since we we're a nonprofit. And this is the logo that um, actually Frank Neesmith's niece created that for us. Um, speaking of Frank Neesmith, um, he was one of those key residents um, there at Sunset Beach. Um, you know, probably tear up talking about him, but Frank is my coastal hero. He, um, for decades back, you know, starting back in the 50s, you know, has been exploring the creeks and marshes and beautiful dune system of Sunset Beach and Bird Island. And actually back in the early seventies, he and a friend erected this mailbox called the Kindred Spirit. And what's amazing to me, I, I haven't been to Bird Island. The last time I went was actually in October for a, a very, very small memorial service for Frank because he actually passed away last July. But the popularity of this Kindred Spirit mailbox has actually grown with every year. 
and there's actually a, a Facebook page and everything about them. But this guy right here, Frank, I'd call him, in my opinion, kind of the, he gave the campaign to save Bird Island a face and to fall in love with. And, and just this instant recognition of something truly special and unique about uh, Bird Island. So on part of our campaigns, we formed the Bird Island Preservation Society and we had to get really creative. So um, one of the first things we did is we thought, well, we need to really bring attention to the fact that this, this area is incompatible for this you know, really dense, heavy development and a huge bridge uh, over an inlet. You know, that just, that can't be consistent with laws and rules. But here, this, you know, you can see here, the waters are shallow. Um, but one of the neatest things we did was put together almost like a boat parade. It was a tour and we took about six different skiffs um, with media. They had, you know, back then they had the big cameras rolling and everything. And we, um, we took then state representative Redwine kind of out all around these meandering creeks that led over to Bird Island, back over here, or back probably back over here actually, um, to show just how uh, dynamic and fragile this area was. And that is one of the first things that really gained uh, public attention and recognition about the project or, or the proposal and, and really mounted began to mount people's interest in saving Bird Island. Did that along with, and these are things kind of that this Bird Island Preservation Society group did, they, Frank here in the yellow shirt, he thought, well, you know, we need to get people aware of this. And so he started leading educational walks every Wednesday in the summer. And those educational walks just grew and grew and grew with more and more participants coming each Wednesday to learn about the proposal for development and how fragile this area was and how special it was and how it should be preserved in perpetuity. People were inspired by the walks and by, you know, outreach that we did. We created Bird Island or BIPs is what we called it, newsletters. And people started, you know, from all over the country, people who had come to visit and either learned from one of the walks or um, from the newsletter, they, you know, they, started signing petitions from all over the country. People started writing letters. They started sending checks. So, I mean, it's just people really got um, enthused by this kind of grassroots movement. And again, you know, the thing that's really special, this was not just any, you know, piece of coastal land. It had honestly this, I think, spiritual connection of having the kindred spirit mailbox because people have been coming to that mailbox, you know, again, remember it was, it was put up first in the, in the seventies and people have, I think made a real personal connection to that island through this kindred spirit mailbox. And actually, before I forget, I mean, we would take out these, if you can see here, these are actually journals. These are notebooks that, that are kept in the kindred spirit mailbox and um, people write all kinds of thoughts, happy, sad, um, people have proposed, um, you know, it's just amazing what people write. And actually, if anyone was interested, many of the journals, both the old historic ones and then ones that are collected now are actually housed at the Randall Library at UNC Wilmington. So they're there for, for folks uh, to be able to see. Um, so those were kind of the, the boat tour, the, the walks, those were kind of the the Bird Island Preservation Society campaign, more of the public side of getting people aware and, and understanding. And then more of the, I'd say, policy side, the Coastal Federation really led by Todd Miller and then the Southern Environmental Law Center really took the lead in making a formal case to um, the North Carolina Coastal Resource Commission, um, you know, urging them to, um, deny the permit application that the owners of the island were applying for, again, to build a mile long bridge system and causeway. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Stephanie real quick. So it's 12.15, do we get started later? I've already started talking too long. <laughs> no, you're, you're fine. I, okay. I, you're good, tell the okay. truth, we're here to hear it. <laughs> okay, all right, I just wanted to check in. Okay. But so on that front, it took about, um, 
three and a half years. Um, but finally, the permits were denied. And the reason why they were denied, it was basically a declaratory ruling. I think I actually had that on that slide, saying that the proposal for the bridge was incompatible with the inlet hazard rules. So the bridge was over 5,000 square feet and the inlet hazard rule said that um, no structure of greater than 5,000 square feet should be um, in that inlet hazard area. And I'm a little bit foggy on the specifics of that. I was trying to look it up and, and then didn't get to that. But basically, and happily, the permit for the, uh, for the proposal was denied. So then after the permits were denied, of course, we celebrated, right? But you can imagine the property owner was not celebrating. He was mad as hell, and I don't blame him. And um, so then it, it took it took some cooling down period a little bit. And that's when Camilla and the Coastal Land Trust really went to work. Um, so I would consider pretty much the Coastal Federation and the Southern Environmental Law Center's role was more to get the permits denied. And then through this collaboration, then it's kind of, then it, it evolved into Camilla working with the Division of Coastal Management Reserve Program to really kind of close the deal and then look for money and secure you know, funding to purchase the island. Isn't this a beautiful photograph? This was taken recently by Ray Kennedy and was forwarded to me by Noel. I think she's on, um, but isn't that just lovely? Um, so then, well, actually, let me tell you a couple of the funding sources I wanted to mention that. So Beth, you know, Camilla got to work. It was, it was actually determined that um, Coastal Reserve Program should really kind of be lead applicant for these funding sources. And so the funding actually came from the North Carolina Clean Water Management Trust Fund. There was a um, one million, million and a quarter um, grant from that entity to purchase phase one, which was approximately half of the island. And then the North Carolina Natural Heritage Trust Fund, that was another 750,000 that was secured. And then some additional funding came from the North Carolina DOT Transportation Enhancement Fund. Um, and then there were other phases as well. There was a second Clean Water Management Trust Fund for another uh, one and a half million that was secured to, to purchase the island. Um, that funding source now has changed names as the North Carolina Clean, Clean, Water, Clean Land Water Fund. I think I probably messed that up. Um, but anyway, the good news was the land was, was finally secured. Now, all of that took about 10 years. So that, you know, kind of said that in about 10 minutes, but all of that campaign took about 10 years. Um, but finally, in 2002, um, Rhode Island was formally dedicated as the state's 10th coastal reserve, which is really exciting. And so now the, um, and that reserve program, which if you don't know, it was authorized by the General Assembly in 1989 to protect and manage unique coastal resources. And so there are several reserve sites um, up and down the North Carolina coast, but this truly is a special one. And it's managed by reserve manager, Hope Sutton, who's been with the division quite a while. She was actually an intern for the Coastal Federation in the early years. Um, and, you know, that kind of what started Bird Island cause, which was people and passion has grown. <laughs> um, and now it's, there's an amazing group of volunteers who, they're called the Bird Island Stewards. And so when, when Frank got too old to walk or when we kind of, kind of felt like, well, we've done our part, we saved the island, this whole group, you know, the island didn't then just sit there by itself. It has an army of dedicated, lovely people who continue to showcase Bird Island as a truly magnificent place. They lead educational walks in the summertime, just like we did back in the early 90s to, to, to gain attention about the proposed development. Now the stewards are giving walks as on a volunteer basis um, to talk about the value of, of Bird Island and to, to tell people how to manage it. You know, don't leave your trash, don't run on the dunes, don't, you know, don't uh, do certain things, but enjoy this truly special place. They talk about the, the bird and wildlife habitat um, of Bird Island. So they're really serving just an amazing service to the state of North Carolina by, by continuing this legacy of, of love for Bird Island and um, 
you know, the, the flora and fauna that call it home. Um, they also do trail maintenance and a lot of work on the island. If hurricanes are coming, they go and they pull up the signs. I mean, and, and then of course the mailbox, they um, take care of the wonderful kindred spirit mailbox and have a wonderful bench there so that people can come. And so this, this kind of groundswell of support that started by one man putting a mailbox on a truly special place has just exploded into, you know, almost international interest and love for Bird Island. Um, some of the recent activity back in uh, 2016, there was actually a nature trail added to allow visitors to access kind of the backside of the area of the island so that they could enjoy the maritime, you know, shrub forest and the grasslands. Um, and then most recently in 2020, there was actually an extra area, 35 acre area, um, Sunset, Be Sunset Beach West parcel that was actually acquired um, with some funds by the General Assembly, which actually added to the reserve. Um, and then um, kind of some, also some recent activity, which I think I mentioned earlier, but Frank Neesmith, who was my coastal hero and kindred spirit, he passed away in July, but that's a picture of me. I went to visit him, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, probably now, probably two years ago. And I took him some memorabilia like that Wilmington Star News article reminded him of the headline at the time. And that was the actual, um, well, actually it was not. I was gonna say that was the actual headline, but it was not that big. I think I blew that up for him. But the neat thing, of, if you guys are interested is that if you were to Google Frank Neesmith today, and the Kindred Spirit mailbox, all kinds of things pop up. And Frank and Bird Island and the Bird Island Preservation Society and the collaborative work of everyone involved, um, you know, it's just, it's lasting. And that's what's been so amazing about this. I mean, it was featured in the New York Times. Uh, if you Google, you can find there's a CBS evening, evening news segment about the Kindred Spirit mailbox and just about, you know, any outlet um that you know of and again if you haven't been to bird island um highly recommend it it's you just drive to sunset beach and then go down to the last walkover and you can access the reserve um almost everybody's going so at this i would love to credit this uh when i find out who did it but i it was sent to me over the weekend but i just think this is wonderful <laughs> it's just one of my it is my absolute favorite bernie meme and then you can see um, the love of the Kindred Spirit mailbox here. It's got its uh, holiday Christmas decoration. And I will, I think kind of in closing, just say that one of my favorite um, statements in the Kindred Spirit mailbox that I found in one of the notebooks back in the early nineties was let progress be in keeping something that can never be created again. And that's what I always thought about Bird Island, about what progress we made in this collaborative effort to keep Bird Island as a place that everyone from all over the country and all over the world can come and enjoy in perpetuity. That's real progress, you know, not, not just building, you know, another subdivision. So, you know, I think we, we don't do it. And it just kind of reminded me that, you know, a, a big thanks really goes out to the property owners for their willingness to sell this property to the state so that we can have it, you know, forever. And I, anyway, I think, um, I think it's just truly a special place. So I think that's really about all I have to share um, for that segment without going over too much time and thought maybe we could do a few questions or have a little conversation or maybe folks have some comments about Bernie. <laughs> that's great. That is one of the best ones I've seen. I, I agree with you. I, I love that photo. <laughs> you too. That's very good. Thank you. Yay. Hey, Lauren, thank you so much. Um, appreciate you sharing the, the story and the history. Um, I know that there are a bunch of people on this call who, um, who've been to Bird Island, who've been involved, who have been um, volunteers and participants. And um, I will welcome anybody who would like to, to share your perspectives or stories, or if anybody has questions. Um, we've got time, so um, feel free to unmute and 
um, well, we can we can have a conversation, more conversation. Thoughts on the Bernie? Have you seen a better Bernie? We put Bernie at Springer's Point. Uh -huh. um, and we actually had a snowy picture of Springer's Point. So we put Bernie in the snow, um, sitting next to the no parking sign. So um, I would love to see that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Cool. Yeah, that was on our Facebook page too. So let me see. I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any. I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't see anybody okay. um, unmuting. If anyone is trying to talk, but you're on mute, um, feel free to unmute. But if you don't have any questions, that's also cool. Um, I, I'm i curious, like if I was gonna go to Randall, like do you know where I would go to find those journals or? I don't, they do have a whole section on Bird Island. So it's not just the journals, but they've got a lot of our, our documents. You know, I had, I had, gosh, I had uh, three large boxes of just files. So they've got copies of our brochure and our sticker and all of our correspondence back and forth between the state and our newsletters and news articles. So they, they've got a whole collection of things. And um, I guess I you probably would just have to ask at the, at the, um, at the desk, or I could look for a, um, a contact. I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to share that if people were interested. Cool. Um, Dr. Rob Hart at UNCW just commented that you can ask at the special collections in Randall, mm -hmm. um, and they'll they'll get to them. Okay. Um, and let's see. Jeannie, um, I don't know. I don't know about that tour. Um, I think that Van, you, you like put a, um, a link to a virtual tour, but I'm not quite sure how long that is. Um, did you, do you see it? Yeah. Uh, so Michelle, the communication specialist from the reserve sent us a Facebook, uh, oh, okay. she was having some trouble posting it. So I thought I would just drop it in the chat as well. I think it's more like a guided virtual tour more than a video. Um, I just kind of pulled up here. And it looks like you can just go and kind of look at the different places um, and see little points along the line, uh, along the, uh, along the island. Yeah, so I'll, I'll cut in. The um, virtual tour it is, you just click through. We worked on it. Um, and so there's a bunch of things about um, the, you kind of click through on the map and so there's history and animals and everything about Bird Island. That's super cool. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, that is. Excellent. Well, cool. Um, seeing no other questions in the chat, um, I would like to again thank Lauren Colodi for being here today and thank all of the um, participants that came back. <laughs> we took a little break over over uh, the holidays and um, it's good to see such a great group back with us. Um, do stay in touch with us with e news and on our website. We we don't have a talk scheduled for next week, but I have lots of invitations out. Somebody might bite for next Friday. Um, but if they don't, we'll be back February 12th. Um, Kaylin Hernandez is the educator from Cape Fear River Watch, and she'll be here to talk all about the Cape Fear River watershed. Um, and then we're still like locking everything in for the spring, but we do have a couple of talks in March. One about the three sisters on the Black River from mm -hmm. a local guide. That will be fun. Lots of stories there. And then also the Alliance for Cape Fear Trees will um, talk with us about their work. Um, in the region as well. So we do have some things starting to line up. Just keep in touch with us um, and we're going to keep doing the, the little lunch lecture thing for, for, the, for the foreseeable. So um, thanks everybody again. We will Thank see you, you um, in a week or so. <laughs> thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.